So we want to welcome everyone here. Um, with this mic, you can really hear me. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Roger here. He's, uh, he's done these presentations in hundreds of different communities all over the place, all over lots in Alberta. Like, he'll, he'll tell you more. He doesn't want us to talk too much about him, so we'll let him just come up and do his presentation. He's, we're really excited to have him here. This is going to be a, a great opportunity for Raymond. Roger, please. morning. Well, it's good to be here, and I'm going to dig right in because we've had a lot of fun. I am here with my wife, Jane. She's way back there. Stand up, Jane. There she is. And uh, when you secret shop a place, it's always good to have a woman with you because they account for most of the spending. And that's actually true. And so we have been here all week. We've had a great time. And I want to dig right in and talk about what we've been doing. This whole thing is, we call this a destination assessment. We have been secret shopping, Raymond, since Monday. We've gone around the area. Um, we've you know, eaten at the restaurants that are open here. Um, there was no interviews, no heads up. Greg was our, probably our primary contact, but we didn't even talk to him at all until once we were here, and that was mainly about the audiovisual and everything for this. And so there was no input on things to do. So we came just like anybody else would come here looking for a place to live, work, or, or retire, whatever. So now, our experience through this, we have assessed nearly 1,700 communities in 45 states across Canada, Western Europe, Scandinavia, even down on the island of Mauritius in Africa. In Canada, we assessed virtually every single city and town in Nova Scotia. So if you ever go to Nova Scotia, you can email me and say, Roger, what are the top 10 lighthouses and everything? And I can give you that list. And then we've worked with dozens of cities and towns in British Columbia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, PEI, Quebec, Ontario. I've been in Ontario six times this year so far. And we have also worked at a lot of places in Alberta. And I don't even know that I got them all on here, but we have spent a lot of time, let me go back to that. We spent a lot of time here and a lot of it in Southwest Alberta. So we actually, several years ago, we did assess like, um, you know, Cardston and Pincher Creek and we're up in Crow's Nest Pass and Claire's home and you name it. Alberta, I've always kidded, that is my second home. And during the recession, Alberta kind of kept us alive because this is where oil and gas came from up north. And now, of course, Alberta is the province that's been kind of hurting because oil and gas prices have been low. But I've also spoke at regional conferences here, worked with um, the uh, Ontario Business Improvement Association, and on and on. So, spent a lot of time here, and it's been great. This was our first time we'd ever been in Raymond. When we do this assessment, we look at marketing. We look at your website, search engines, social media. Uh, is it good enough to close the sale? We look at how do you stack up against everybody else because there's a lot of cool stuff in southern Alberta, particularly southwest Alberta with, water, with Waterton and, and all the national parks and everything. We looked at printed materials. We even called and secret shopped and had people send us materials. But what we've been doing this week and what I'm really going to concentrate on this morning is what we saw when we are here. What was our first impression, signage, gateways? Could we find stuff? Overall appeal, what was our first impression? Downtown, what business mix, your hours, curb appeal. And so all of these things are what I'm going to talk about. And we've had a great time. Now, when we do this, we wear three hats. This is not just about tourism. We look at this, is this a place I would want to live and raise a family or retire? And is this a place I would come and invest in? It looks like it's a growing community, and would I, would I spend money here, bring a business here? And then thirdly, would I come here to visit? And so when I do this, I'm going to do like seven different chapters. 
And with that as a beginning, our first thing we did is we did call, we got information. What was sent to us was Southwest Alberta Travel Guide, and it did have a two-page spread about Raymond. One thing that came up really quick was we just noticed in all the photos that it's, it's swimming, it's horseback, it's sports, it's golf, it is hockey, it is... And we just thought, boy, this place is really about sports. You know, really plays that up. And then we read, like, what, champ, football champions and on and on. And so, so right away we saw, oh, good, they got the Broadway theater. That gives you some cultural depth. And then we saw Centennial Park, Victoria Sports Park, I mean, golf course. All of these things were right there. But we also were sent a couple other brochures that we just loved. And we don't get to say this everywhere. And it was this one. 10 things to do in Raymond. And we love, people love lists. Seven best, five this. And so 10 things to do in Raymond. And so this was really great. It has a golf course, Victoria Sports Park, uh, the Aquatic Center, uh, Can Canada Days. I went on and on. And this was a really great brochure. And we used this as kind of our Bible while we were here. And so that was really, really helpful for us. And then we got another brochure, which was, and by the way, these are things that you saw in the other one, and then we even added these. I mean, you were the first stampede. I mean, there was a lot of firsts in Raymond that we had no clue that you had. And so once we saw these, we just, you know, highly rank you sports. We just kind of, to us, it was like, wow, if we had kids that, that were at home in sports, I don't care whether it's motocross or football or hockey, this would be a great place to raise them. Then the other brochure we got was this one, Reasons to Move to Raymond. And we also love this. You know, um, it's, I love the way it's designed and everything. And it really said a lot about family being here. But it talked about, you know, pricing differences, gridlock traffic, getting rid of that. Um, and I thought it was, just, it was just really well done. And then finally, we did look at the, the uh, Town of Raymond's website, which we thought was really well done. There's a few little things in there. We've already <laughs> said there's some links that are broken and stuff. But other than that, it was really good because it had the 10 things to do. It talked about the Mormon Trail. It talked about interactive maps, where Raymond is. It really had a lot of good information. And boy, were we surprised to find Raymond even has an app. So if you're always wondering what there is to do in Raymond, you can download that app for Android or iPhone. We also spent time on Wikipedia, like a lot of people do if they're looking for a place, and so we could get a little a bit of the history. And then we also went over to the Facebook page where this, this, this morning was being marketed. Um, love the picture of the Aquatic Center. And then we also looked at Instagram. Now, throughout this presentation, you're going to see these. These are suggestions. There's no recommendations here because we feel it would be presumptuous for her to come in here and tell you what you should do when we never talk to you first. So all we can do is make suggestions for you, and then you can say, hey, we want to turn that one into a recommendation. We're going to go ahead and implement it. You may see things in here that you're, you may say, well, Roger, we're already, you may think to yourself, Roger, we're already working on it. And in that case, remember, we don't know. But then you've been validated. And so first thing is, I would love to see you have a hashtag. I don't know what that hashtag would be, but I always tell people on your gateway signs, you should always put share your experience, hashtag Raymond Alberta, or, you know, everybody loves Raymond, whatever it is. Do a hashtag there, put it in there so that when people come into town for tournaments, for fishing, for what golf, whatever they're doing, that they will share the experience and you have a common place for them to go. Instagram is huge. So that's first suggestion. So once we looked at all the marketing and everything, we arrived. Now, our first thing is we always try to stay in the community that we're working in. You do have a B and B, but that's more of a social experience, and we always need like two desks and everything because we're working all week. So we did end up staying in Lethbridge, but we came down here every morning, tried to eat breakfast here, tried to eat lunch here, <coughs> and I say tried. 
you had two choices plus ice cream. And after a while, it's like, huh? You know, because even your Chinese restaurant is closed until the middle of September. So we did stay in the Holiday Inn, which was the closest hotel to Southern Lethbridge. So we could get out here easy, 20-minute drive. Now, as we're driving out, the first thing, we did see a sign off the highway that did talk about the motocross park, but we almost missed it. If it wasn't for this little tiny sign over there, as a matter of fact, we drove past it and had to turn around and come back. So we almost missed that. But we did turn there. Um, once again, these are suggestions. We did turn there and we did find Temple Hill. So we went there, the gates were locked, and I assume this is part of it, is that right? But what there is, there's lots of rules and stuff, but there's nothing anywhere on this site that says anything ever happens there. And is it still used? Anybody know? It is. And is it very often? A couple of times. And if it's regular, but somewhere on here, we think it would be really good to have a sign that says, by the way, here's upcoming events because it's an invitation for us to come back. So always invite us back. When you have places like this, always say, hey, here's our schedule events for 2018, 2019, whatever it is. Um, because it's a great site, but it really had about, is more about rules and regulations. Um, even things like this, there's a motorcycle club in Lethbridge. They probably use this a lot. And I always say, you know what, these days, don't do phone numbers. People don't call anybody anymore. What we do is we text them and say, is it okay if I call you now? And so I always would put a website there before I would put a phone number, if they have a website. And I'm guessing that they probably do. Love the sign, though, be part of the fun. It looks like a great motocross site. Um, of course, we couldn't get in, and I didn't dare climb over the barbed wire fence. But it looks like a great spot for all things motocross. And so we thought, that's cool. And it's two miles out of town. We did notice across the street from it, that it looks like a practice track. And even there, there's a sign that just says, if you belong to the club, you can actually get a key and come in and use it on your own time and everything, which I thought was great. However, the sign, it looks like the site hasn't been used in 20 years. And I'm sure it has. And I'm sure it's used because a lot of the track is still, you know, it's not grown over. But once again, when we see signs like this, it's almost as if nobody cares or, you know, they were just letting it go. And so that's just another low-hanging fruit suggestion. So from there, we decided to come into town. Now. This sign. The problem is you never ever use more than 8 to 14 words on a billboard. And this is a tenth the size of a billboard. The problem is the only way to read all of that is if you pull over, get out of your car and walk up to it and read all the text. And people don't do that. So one thing I would suggest is doing that sign. And okay, here it is. I went ahead and changed it for you. Actually, I didn't physically change it, but something like that. If you just put the dates, the times, it's free, family fun, and a website, good. And then we go to the website and we'll say, hey, we do all of this stuff. Make sense? I want you to get more people to come out for Aggie Days, and, and you just need a lot less text. <laughs> so, another easy suggestion. Now, one thing I will tell you is that when we came out to Lethbridge, and we used, I would go, hey, Siri, uh-oh, it's going to go off now. i say, provide directions to Lethbridge. And this is, it always takes us down Highway 4. And, and then when we got here, you know, um, I asked somebody, a local, I said, so when you come from Lethbridge, do you ever come down Highway 5? He said, no, we all come down 4. It's like, what, five minutes faster or something. But here's the challenge, is when you come in this way, and we make that final corner. I videotaped this because I have to tell you that this is all fine right here. This lasts like two minutes. And, um, and so then we see a lot of cars and trucks. Then we see the sign for estates that I'm going, really? Those are estates right there. The fence is kind of falling down. We see kind of trashy looking stuff. 
And then we come down here, we see piles of tires over here, piles of tires over here, blown out signs up there, a lot of weeds right there. Um, and, and so our first impression, Raymond, is, oh my gosh, what are we going to tell these people? And sorry about that wind noise there. And so, you know, we see this is all industrial. We expect that. It's fairly organized right there. Storage, that's all fine. But until we get up to this fire department up, up here at the corner, we just were thinking, whoa, this is pretty rough. And you have to understand, people judge the book by the cover, whether it's fair or not. This is me with a camera out the window. And so, you know, and, and we came around the corner, and then what happens is, as we come around the corner, all of a sudden there's a sigh of relief, because now we see homes that are pretty well taken care of. Uh, we see, you know, now we start to see Raymond for what it is. And so, in, in our book, you might want to put a sign that says downtown Raymond ahead one and a half clicks or what, whatever the distance is, so we don't judge the book by the cover. And I'll stop this right about there. But you know what? For economic development, if you ever invite people out to build industry and everything, I would never tell them to come down four. I would tell them to come down five. And by the way, after the first time that we came here, coming down four, we never went that way, even this morning. We always went this way because it's a prettier drive, it's a nicer drive, it's a great introduction to the community, and it's a few minutes or longer. I mean, I understand if you're trying to get somewhere, that's fine. You know, and when you come this way, it's just, you know, you can see what Raymond has to offer there. Um, this is so much nicer. So I just think that when you encourage people to come here, have them come down five. And you know what, I don't mean to pick on those businesses, it is kind of an industrial area over there. But, you know, little things like this, you know, I, as a matter of fact, I even thought, could you as a community build a six foot high cedar fence down this row where there's a lot of chain link and barbed wire and stuff just to help screen some of it? You know, like this, you know, we actually saw Rocky Mountain Estates and, you know, I think that's a little stretch on the word estates. Um, but, but, you know, I, even buildings like this, you've got a blown out sign right there. It needs paint. There's piles of tires and junk, you know, and, and granted, you know, that their deal, they're not trying to be a top-notch restaurant or something, but still, these are how we judge the book by the cover. And so curb appeal is very important. Now, once we came around that corner, my first thing is, how did we end up in Utah? Just so you know, we have been spent the last five years assessing more than 75 cities and towns in Utah, and we have a long-term contract with the Utah Office of Tourism, and we've gotten to know Utah very, very well. And so when we first went around that corner, and went, oh my gosh, here we are in Utah. We got streets. And this goes back for LDS members to Brigham Young in the day was a great urban planner and every street was designed so a, a covered wagon could do a U-turn in the middle of the street. Well, you know what that does though is, and in Utah we have many, many communities narrowing the streets way down and they're actually putting new curbs in and giving the property to the home so they have longer, bigger front yards. Because you're just maintaining too much roadway. And so... Yes, yeah, so this, you know, and so we just saw these ultra wide roads everywhere and went, yeah, it's just, it's just an excuse to go really fast. And so, we, you know, we thought, man, there's got to be some ways you could do that. We even said, you see these white lines, even if you narrowed it down by a few feet, you could add a bike lane. You could do some other things just to slow traffic down and make it more usable. But when we saw those wide streets, then it was really cemented in when we saw a standalone seminary building, we saw a family history center, um, and we started seeing a state center and ward buildings and stuff everywhere. And we just, we just went, okay, so this has to be a lot of Utah here in obviously LDS. Now, one other thing we noticed, um, oh yeah, that's right, we're not supposed to use LDS anymore. <laughs> right? Everybody got the memo. 
So we also saw a lot of RVs and a lot of boats. So we thought there must be a lake around here somewhere. Now we have worked in Vulcan County and Lomond and some of those areas, so we know that there are some lakes. So we thought we gotta see where all these people go boating. So we did head south and we did find, you know, the Raymond Reservoir. Um, and, and we thought that was pretty cool down there. And we thought this was the reservoir. <laughs> then we looked at our navigation map and say, this looks a little too small. But I thought it would be, you know, what we do is we see water going out. We have no idea how it's getting through this. And we thought this would be good if you did an interpretive sign that talks about hydroelectric power and being more green. And I don't know how many homes that powers or what the equivalent is or whatever. But it's an opportunity to educate people. You know, and then, so we thought this, you know, we thought this, this can't be the reservoir. We're looking at the map. It looks way bigger than that. Um, but we just thought this might be, is there good bird watching and stuff out here? Even hunting? I, I'm not too sure. But it looks like a great asset that could be marketed. Um, I think you should promote it. I think it's great. The thing is, you can promote it. You may say, but it's not right in Raymond. Who cares as long as you can monetize it? If we're stopping at the hardware store to buy fishing gear or something, great. That's spending. We did make it to Market Ridge Park and, and the reservoir. And when we're there, we met Artha. And I guess it's her husband, Levi. They run it and manage it. Um, and we heard all about them. They put three boys on a mission. The, the youngest one's already... I mean, within, within a few hours, we're getting to know Raymond pretty well in the area. And so they do a really good job maintaining the park. It's really beautiful. Um, but it's got the boat ramps, uh, you know, the, the, where you can do that, uh, where you can tie up your boats. And then it had also had a good thing about walleye, talking about when they breed, how big they are. I mean, it had a lot of information that I thought was really, really well done. It is a great campground. Um, and I thought, man, this should be better monetized. I mean, it even has shelters, picnic shelters with stoves in them, which I thought was really awesome. It even has a nice swimming beach with a swim dock on it. A couple little things. Uh, this was one of them. This doesn't really make me want to spend a whole lot of time in Warner County because the map is so dilapidated that you can't even read it. You can read the list, but you don't really know where there is. So for something like this, it needs to be redone. I think somebody put it up and then, and then just, that's it. Never took care of it. But one thing, it's an attraction, great attraction. And one thing we asked is so, and I guess apparently it drains down during the winter months, but gee, mid-April. So we have mid-April to May, June, July, September. You have five months that this reservoir could be a really great asset if you can monetize it in Raymond. So there's a benefit to you besides just living here. The one thing that shocked the heck out of us that there's no potable water there. It shocked us. I'm shocked that you can get water right here, but you can't get it down in the pan campground. And so somebody said, well, we even offered to do a water line, a potable water line inside another line so it wouldn't leach out. And I never knew that leaching potable water would be a bad thing. But I was pretty shocked. I, I hope that somebody here will push whoever into getting potable water. As a matter of fact, you have a, a, this development right here. And, and I'm going, man, look at all these places. People are buying these lots. Raymond is probably Raymond Sterling, or the, the closest town to take advantage of people buying groceries here, eating at restaurants, or shopping here. And yet they have no potable water. I was shocked that people must have like a forklift and they go down there, they fill these up with water, they bring them back. I don't know how anybody can build a house without water. And so that just shocked me. And I, I think if it was me, I'd be at the province somewhere. And remember, we, we didn't talk to anybody. But I was just really shocked that you have development going out there. You've got a great campground and there's no water. So... Somebody, I hope you guys take the lead on pushing that forward. We also, as we're driving back and forth, we saw big, huge operations. Now, is this cattle? Does people, does anybody know? This is a Hutterite colony, but, but what is the industry? So it's dairy? 
chickens, pigs, it's everything. Okay. But we just thought that if you did a, we just think in agriculture areas, even if you did little road signs that just said, this is alfalfa, this is canola, this is barley, this is sugar beets. I don't, I don't even know what's grown here. It's really good education for people to know what it is you're growing. So those are cool things that you can do that talk about, you know, that here we, this is a, a livestock farm. Um, they've got the power, the windmills there and everything. So, but look like a pretty good operation. Um, even things like signs, you know, home of famous Alberta beef, you know, those kinds of things. Always take the opportunity to educate people. Because when you do that, we're tied to you more. And we're going to come back more often as visitors. So coming into town, we did see the gateway signs. They're very nice. Uh, my only challenge is, you know, that as we've worked in like 60 or 70 towns in Alberta, and almost every one of them has a bucking bronco. And I know you were the first, but it's hard to overshadow the Calgary Stampede and Pincher Creek and everybody else. But once again, I'm not saying change these. I'm just going, what else do you have? So that was kind of checking out the area around you. But this led us to this. There's two initiatives here that are, that are not just low-hanging fruit. This is one of them. Little things that are very frustrating. We see the sign right here. It says golf course right there. We got a picture of golfer. We've got the rodeo grounds and arrow. So we do turn left there. We go down the street. And there's a sign for the road grounds and no more signs for a golf course anywhere. If we had not been doing assessment, we would have never found your golf course. So, you know, this is your, should be your top priority. So I want to talk about wayfinding for a minute. These are, there should be signs that say, here's where you could get visitor info. This is where public washrooms are. Parking areas, medical, police, fire, community services. All of these things need to be on wayfinding. Attractions like your sports facilities, camping, boat launches, public access points, trail markers. All of these things are part of a wave of pole banners that support your brand, what you're about. These are wayfinding signs. There's never more than five items on a sign. They need to be easy to read. This one is mounted on a on a pole, this one is mounted on the ground. And, and these wayfinding signs, they don't have to be overly expensive. This is Appleton in Wisconsin. This sign right here is like $750. It's mounted on an existing power pole. And by the way, they put up 18 of those and their retail sales and services went up by almost 15%. You need to do wayfinding. It plays a role in your branding efforts because they'll look like whatever it is you want to be known for. They're in your marketing efforts. If you tell us you've got these facilities and we can't find it, you end up with frust frustrated people. And it reinforces a positive experience, increases spending. It educates your visitors and locals about what you got and where it's at. And then it builds community pride. And by the way, this is as much a science as an art. In Pincher Creek, they said, Roger, you're right, we need wayfinding. So their public works department built a wayfinding system and they had to take it all out because it was so small and they had too many things on a sign, it wasn't readable. It's quite a science to do in this. And so studies show that wayfinding will increase retail sales and services between 14 and 28%. And that is really, really important. Um, and then by the way, navigation systems are not a substitute for wayfinding. Cars now have navigation systems. Heck, I use the iPhone. Most cars have Apple Play. And, and you know what? This week, I would say, hey, Siri, provide directions to Town Hall in Raymond, Alberta, and it would take me to Vulcan's County offices in Vulcan. Or I'd say, okay, it, so it doesn't have Town Hall. Um, Greg, you call, this is the community, you, you call this the community center, right? So I asked Siri, okay, take me to the community center. It doesn't know it. It took me someplace in Lethbridge. So what happens is we use wayfinding to find things we already know exist, which we, wouldn't, we don't know that you have. So these wayfindings tell us about stuff you have that we didn't know to look for. 
And that's why this is so important. It should be one of the top things you, if anybody's coming out here to look, is this a place I want to raise my family? I want to get out of the rat race in Lethbridge or Calgary. I want to look at Raymond. Are they going to find your health center? Are they going to find a lot of stuff? As a matter of fact, if we had not been digging deep, been here for a week, we would have never found your golf course. We probably wouldn't have found your hospital medical facilities because we would have just come up and down Broadway. You know, Prairie Ridge housing, I mean, these are Parrot Park. We would have never found Parrot Park. We almost never found it anyway. And Egg Society Heritage Center, Victoria Sports Park, all of this stuff we would not have found had we not been here for day after day. Looked, and we drove just about every single city street there was, residential. And then we go, oh my gosh, where did that come from? And then there's other little frustrating things. Like, see this sign right here? It says that there's an RV. It looks like a campground or whatever. There's an arrow pointing down here. And so you know what we did? We did turn left. We went all the way up this dirt road. We went all the way up in here. We're out here in the boonies. I think this is like the motocross site out there. We never found it. Because there's no sign. So we came all the way back. I went to the gas station, and a young man there said, well, it's right across the street. Well, then, and so we went across the street. Now, there is on your maps, and right here it says camping. We never found a camp spot here. Is there camping here? Did it used to be camping? See, because on the Alberta maps, it still shows a campground there. The signs show campground but there's no campground. There's a picnic spot, and maybe this is a, is this a dump site for RVs? Is it still work? See, those are the things that are missing. So for crying out loud, move this sign on the other side of the street. See, these are the things that are disconnects. And so driving around, we did find um, the Prairie Ridge, which, by the way, looks beautiful, retirement or um, I don't know if it's assisted or whatever, but it looks very, very nice. We saw what was built, being built right across the street from it. Very, very nice. But would somebody know about it? What if they were looking to live here? How would they know? We did find a trail system here. I don't know how long it is. I don't know where it goes. If you're on one side of the street, look that way, you see it right there. If you go on the other side of the street, you also see it there. And these are things you could do if you just had a sign that says, hey, we have 2.5 kilometers of trails and show a map of where they start and end would be awesome. So for you as locals, it's great. But for somebody looking for a place to live, work, or invest, these things are important. We did also find beautiful homes. Um, I mean, you found, we found every range of home you could possibly even think of um, homes like this and homes, beautiful homes like this. Uh, I mean, we started taking pictures of houses and you know what we were doing? We started pulling up housing prices. That tell you we liked the area. And we started seeing things, you know, and, and uh, some of these had, um, were, were just stunning. And what we were surprised is there's houses for like less than $100,000 and then there's houses for like, well, close to a million or more. And it's all in one community. And so we thought that was pretty outstanding. We loved the fact we saw lots of houses with horses. And our first impression is, man, maybe Equestrian should be their brand, what they want to be known for. Um, I mean, these are stunning places. This one here has its own riding arena, and it's a whole complex. And the, so this right here, we just said, maybe this would should be what Raymond is about. You know, not too sure. And then, of course, we saw the one we wanted and probably a lot of other people, and you're probably waiting for that to show up. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I hear some locals, call, I mean, it's got the two widow's walks and everything. We were just, we were um, it just it, this is all in one town. You don't usually don't see this kind of money invested in small rural towns. And so that's great. That just tells you that must, the quality of life must be so good that people are willing to invest this kind of money. So, of course, what we did is we went online, started looking at houses. Some of them are a little rough. But, you know, we started looking at, and we just saw every possible conceivable house range. And so we thought, wow, young families could live here. 
well-to-do families could live here. And so that made the cost of living and the, the availability of homes there it was pretty darn good. Um, and I'm not sure this was everything, but um, um, we were pretty impressed. Now, so, so far we're having, once we get into town, we're having a pretty good first impression. Then we did find the, um, you know, the mental health facility. And our, my first comment was, it's closed. Living here is so good, it no longer need this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it wasn't full of locals, probably. But when we see buildings like this, the first thing I think of, and I have no idea what the future is for this, what's going to happen, what condition it's in. But I always think of, man, this would be great artist live workspace. Artisans love, and there's even co-ops and stuff, they love places like this because they can go in there and they create like apartments above and they do workspace below. So, you know, I have no idea what its future is. If there is something going to happen there, add it on the signage. We did see the B&B um, when we were coming in from the other direction, um, from another direction. If you ask me to find this right now again, I kind of remember where it's at, but without wayfinding signings, I'm not sure you find it. And of course, nearby, we did find your health center. What's really interesting is because we stayed in Lethbridge and we ate a lot of our meals in Lethbridge, we would always ask, so do you ever go down to Raymond? And at one place, um, one of the girls said, um, she goes, yes, our family, if we can't see our doctor here in Raymond, or if there is an emergency and we can't get in, we go to Raymond for the health care. And then last night when we were eating in Lethbridge, we asked the guy, do you ever go to Raymond? He goes, yes, I go there for the dentist. And this is in Lethbridge. So you're pretty well known for your health care. Um, so I thought, that's good that they don't see it as, oh, out in Raymond. They just say, yeah, that's really great. A lot of people, we when we asked, do you ever go out to Raymond, They one, uh, one person said, yeah, we love going out there for their performances at the theater. I went, yes. What was cool is here we are in, Ray, in Lethbridge, which, by the way, is the fourth largest city in the province. I think I read somewhere it was fifth. It's actually fourth. Fourth. But what was really interesting is, is that nobody in Lethbridge, usually when you live in an urban area and you ask somebody, do you ever go out to Raymond? I mean, we heard this when we said, do you ever go out to uh, Pincher Creek or whatever? Nobody talked Raymond down. Nobody said, oh, there's nothing out there. They said, oh, well, yeah, close to Raymond is is the reservoir, or they would say, yeah, we go out there for the doctors, we go out there to watch a play, or we go there for rodeo. And so that was cool. So that's a good thumbs up for you that people did not say, oh, they're out there somewhere. As a matter of fact, everywhere we ate, there were employees that live here that work there. Here's the thing, is if they live here and work in Lethbridge, they're earning their money in Lethbridge, they're spending their money in Lethbridge, and yes, they might be tied to their neighborhood, they might be tied to the church, they might be tied to the schools, but they're not tied to the community. And that's a missing ingredient in Raymond. We're going to talk about that. We also saw this, Victoria Sports Park, this is world class. We worked in cities that were 10 times bigger than you that didn't have facilities this nice. I mean, this is amazing. Um, I mean, I even went out on the track and went, oh my gosh, I wanted to go run, walk the track, run the track. I mean, we were just pretty impressed. One thing we noticed, I mean, you, you even have a fitness club there. They're open early in the mornings. They're open in the evenings. Um, I mean, and next door, you've got a judo club. And I just went, we got to talk about branding. What is your unique selling proposition? So I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this. What sets you apart from everybody else in Southern Alberta, if not Alberta? And here's why this is important. Is 97% of community-based marketing is ineffective. 
Because towns everywhere say we have something for everyone. You know what? There are 5,000 incorporated cities and towns in Canada, and I could find information on any of them 10 seconds. You just give me a name, I'll go on the web, and, and within 30 seconds, I tell you the population, where it's located, what its primary industries are, just like that. So you have to stand out from the crowd. Matter of fact, 90% of all Canadians have immediate access to the internet, and out of that, 94% use the internet to decide where we're gonna live, where we're gonna start a business, where we're gonna go this weekend. We're using the web, we're using social media. And so here's the question you have to answer. What do you have in Raymond that the people you're trying to attract can't get or do closer to home? Whether they're in Calgary, whether they're in Lethbridge, whether they're in Sterling, whether, wherever they're at. That is the question you have to answer. Why should somebody invest here? Why should somebody move here? Why should people visit you? And you have to be either different or clearly better. Now, see that clearly better? That's not because you think it's better. It's because third party thinks it's better. Right? Because everybody, you know what? And by the way, what doesn't work is, oh, we're Mayberry. We're the leave it to beaver town. We have small town charm. You know how many times I've heard that in Alberta? Tons. And so here's what branding is all about. I'm just going to do this as a quick recap. Logos and slogans are not brands. Have you ever gone anywhere because they had a great logo? Have you ever said, you know what? Let's head over to Claire's home. They have a really cool logo. Or you said, nah, I really don't want to head up over to Champion because I think their logo sucks. By the way, I have no idea. Actually, I do know what their logo looks like. We developed it. It's fine. But the problem is we don't care where the logos are. We don't, that, that isn't why we go anywhere. Your logo, your tagline is only an exclamation point. I'll give you an example. Whenever you do anything, this part, this is a sample ad, a full page ad. This whole part is what you're about. This is Devon, Devon, Fight Town, Alberta. And then this little part down here is where we prove that you're really Bike Town. And then over there's their logo. It's just an exclamation point, and there's their website for more information. So logos and slogans are not brands. A brand is a perception. It's what people think of you when you say, I'm from Raymond. If they go, where's that? They have no perception. But it's whatever they think of you. And then successful brands have a narrow focus. There are 352 cities and towns in Alberta. That's incorporated towns. Here's the question. What sets you apart from the other 351? You're not the only one with a rodeo. Yeah, you had the first one, but what really set you apart? And so if your message could fit anyone else in your market, you need to toss it and start over. Or prove through third-party endorsements that it's so much better, we'll skip over the same thing closer to home. So to win as a town, you must jettison the generic. So this is what I say. If I go to your website, if I go to brochures, and by the way, this applies to any of you in business. If it could fit anybody anywhere, stop it and start over. I love what John Mayer said. Most times when you try to be all things to all people, you end up being nothing. So the narrower your focus, the stronger your success will be. You need to stand out from the crowd. Something for everyone will result in mediocrity and ultimate failure. So once again, I just want to keep pounding that in. I'm going to give you an example. St. Albert. Population, I know, bigger, 61,000. Claim to fame, highest taxes in Alberta. How do you like that as your brand? You know, what's funny is when we ask people in St. Albert, they use the L'Oreal line because it's worth it. They didn't have any problem paying the high taxes. But their challenge is they want to be more than a bedroom community, in their case, to Edmonton. You know, their brand is they're a high-end bedroom community. And so remember, that's what people think of them. So they became the Botanic Art City. This is their logo. Now, you may have heard of Lois Hole. She was a provincial educator. I mean, the whole family has 
a, a huge nursery up there. When St. Albert decided to become the, the, the gardening city, the botanic arts city, their tagline is cultivate life. All of a sudden, Jim Hole, Jim and his brother and sister, because of the brand, they spent $300 million to build the Enjoy Center in St. Albert. It is the nicest gardening and outdoor living center in all of North America. I'm talking about the U.S. and Canada. I mean, it is incredible what they've done. Now, it needs to be better monetized, but they can put conferences there. If they had a 200-room hotel next to it, that's where their next step is, then they could use this in the winter months for all kinds of conferences, conventions. But their brand, Cultivate Your Own Masterpiece, it's about gardening. Cultivate the musician in you, and then can you spread it out, the chef in you. As a matter of fact, what's really cool about St. Albert is people in Edmonton go to their farmer's market rather than their own farmer's market in Old Strathcona. They go to St. Albert. They even put their brand promise on a kiosk right in the middle of downtown. And they even did this, because if you're gonna talk the talk, you better walk the walk. So what they said is businesses downtown, if you will put beautification, beautify your storefronts, the city will pay 50% up to $2,500. So if you spend five grand, we'll pay $2,500 of it. Just to give you one idea, is this is a coffee shop, Thomas Coffee Shop. He actually changed the name. This is before, this is after. Yeah, his sales went up 400%. The mayor said, I can never even get a seat in there so busy. The mayor was out riding his bike one day and he was going through a neighborhood and there was a cedar fence and the cedar fence was painted with floral designs. The whole way, all these beautiful florals. So he got off his bike, walked up to the door, knocked on the door and asked a lady who did it. She goes, well, it was a guy from Toronto that moved to St. Albert because he heard our brand was about botanicals and that's what he does for a living. They have landscape architects, other nurseries. It's not just Holes and Joy Center. They have all of these people moving to St. Albert because they stand for something. They've won national awards for the botanic arts uh, brand. Their botanic park just went through the roof they, because they sell lots of plants and people were coming from everywhere. Even restaurants getting things right locally, their farmer's market. Even the gateway sign went from this to this. It works. So your brand, by the way, must cross all sectors of tourism, downtowns, economic development, and community development. I'll give you another one. This is Canmore. It's the mountain sports capital. They don't usually use that, but it's what they're known for. Did you know there are more surgeons and doctors? They live in Canmore and they commute to Calgary. You know what's happening now? There are people in Calgary going to Canmore for medical practice because that's where they live. So when you have your brand, it could be almost similar for you. So this is what they did. But in their thing, it's all about that way of life. The key to keeping your balance is knowing when you've lost it, this is where you get it back. I mean, these are all their ad concepts. Risk everything, fear nothing, live with no regrets. This is all about achieving more. Life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. And of course, they're right there in one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. If you can change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I mean, this, and I thought a little bit of this could apply to Raymond in the sports things that people come out here for. Start by doing what's uh, necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. You know, I love this. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So do something new. Try something new. You know, don't limit your challenges. Challenge your limits. I mean, they went through a whole bunch of these. Um, you know, the difference, oh, this is my favorite. The difference between try and triumph is a little umph. I don't think, you could do that here with judo. You could do it here with foot golf. You could do it here with a bunch of things. And so just doing, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, the ability to triumph begins with you always. You know, so they did a whole series of these and I don't need to show them all. But Canmore, 
I always say is the best town in Alberta as far as it's downtown. I mean, you know what? It's cleaned Banff's clock. Because Banff became factory tourism. But places like Canmore, you still go to Community Tea. They only have two franchises in their downtown. They don't allow any more. It's a subway. And it is a Rocky Mountain Soap Company, which, by the way, there's only six of those. And it's Canadian. The other one is Bike Town, Alberta, Devon. This is Janet and Michelle. We were working with Travel Alberta. They came and they said, we should leverage our bike trails. And they said, we are a biking community. The population is 6,000. And so they, they got the city stencil, welcome to Bike Town as you drive in. They're leveraging 30 miles of paved biking trails that go down to the river. Some of them are ultra steep. And, and their whole deal is, this is not mountain biking. They want people to put their expensive street bikes on the backs of their Beamers in Edmonton to drive out to, drive out to, De to Devon. And it worked. Even when it came to cancer awareness, breast cancer awareness, they took old bikes and painted them pink and lined them up and down their main street. They even went and got Bike Town shirts and their council people wear them. They even trademarked spokesperson. <laughs> you know what happened? Raleigh Bikes, I think it was Raleigh or Giant, one of the bike companies said, oh my gosh, we wish we would have thought of that. You know what they said? Build us a velodrome so we can have biking in the winter and we'll give you the trademark. Now, the town decided that, gee, we have so much more than biking. Their tagline is grab life by the handlebars. So they decided, yeah, we don't need that velodrome because we'd have to donate the land. And I'm going, are you kidding and then they decide, well, let's just, you know, we have so much more in biking. Let's just go do our new tagline. Our new brand will be Grab Life. I can do that anywhere. And so they really kind of lost it a little bit. But you know what was really cool is they have, TSN did a contest all across Canada. The town with the most votes would win a $25,000 award from from TSN to build a, to design a bike park. So they had their junior high and high school kids. They were calling everybody to vote, vote, vote. They called us and we had our staff voting for Devon. And you know what? Devon, town of 6,000, outcompeted everybody, including Toronto, and they won it. And within days, they were designing a bike park, which is now open. See, once you have a focus, and when you're youth champion, how cool is that? And so this is what their ads used to look like. You know, so they would run things like this. And they talk about gear grinding hills and, and being biking utopia. You know, and so that's what they're about. Now, they're not trying to take mountain biking away from Banff and Jasper and some other places. This is all about street biking. Their market is Edmonton. They're not trying to compete with Calgary. I love that. Only a biker understands why a dog sits his head out the window. <laughs> so we designed billboards like this and like this to, pro, to, to prove their ownership. The first one went up. And you know, when uh, a couple years ago when you did the, uh, what is it, the, uh, uh, the big bike race in Canada, uh, tour, uh, the Tour of Alberta. There was, of course, it's in Edmonton, it's in Red Deer, it's in Calgary, it's, uh, you know, I don't know if it was out in Lethbridge. They could not overlook Devon, this little town, which hosts stage two of the Tour of Alberta. They even did little bookmarks like this that they end up talk about biking. Even when they promoted their best restaurants, it was all top gear. You know, they did a trail guide. I mean, even the city's logo and everything all looks like that. They started doing pole banners that were like that, and that, that would be like this, and these are actually up. You know, they would do posters and put them around town that say, we're all about biking. And you know, it worked. And they're now developing the wayfinding system. It all has the same color schemes. Even the trails now have names, the river trail, canyon trail, Thunder Trail, you name it. Even the website, Bike Town Alberta. You know, I mean, everything is there and the kids live it and families started moving there because their kids are big into BMX. 
And this is that bike park they built. And you know what? They can't even keep the logo gear in stock. So what's your niche? What's your brand? So brands have a narrow focus. They're built on product, not just marketing. Marketing will bring people to Raymond just once, period. The only thing that would ever bring us back is your product, your downtown and its activities. I'm going to talk about that. The complimentary activities, what else you got for me? Your amenities, parking, washrooms, the people they interact with. So, and number five, a brand is a promise. If you say you're something when we get here, it better be here. I love this quote. I can't give you a surefire formula for success, but I can give you a formula for failure. Try to please everybody all the time. And there's only three killers of a branding effort. One is local politics, and it's worse with membership organizations than it is with elected officials. Lack of champions and lack of money, both public and private. And by the way, this is in gold, lack of champions. If you have the right champions in place, you'll get through the politics and you'll find a way to make it happen. By the way, the best branded places are built on private sector money, not public sector amenities. Think about it. Nashville and country music, Napa Valley and wine, Orlando and Disney, Anaheim and Disney. I mean, let's see, I, I'm trying to think. You know, I mean, even Canmore and its sports and all of those things. So, that's it. So we kept going, man, what, I don't know for Raymond, but with VSP Fitness, with the Judo Club, with the equestrian rodeo that you have with motocross, with BMX. I had somebody locally said there's a BMX in the works a track. I mean, you have soccer, you have football, you have hockey, and yes, almost everybody has those. But you have a really fabulous ice rink. Um, I mean, and then, you know, um, that looks amazing. Um, you've got the tennis courts right there. You know, so I thought, man, you could even add tennis to that. I mean, even here in the community center, if you go out there, when you go back down the stairs, there's a bulletin board. And on that bulletin board, it talks about the Knights Club. There's, night, there's different clubs that do these different things here. I mean, it's already ingrained to who you are. You've got a great aquatic center, um, you know, and, and I mean, it looks amazing. Um, you know, it was first day of school, so I had to take pictures through a chain link fence longing to go in there. But it looks, it's just amazing. And I thought, man, you could do competitive swimming. You even have diving. Most, most community pools don't even have diving anymore. Oh, it's a risk, you know, but you do. Um, one suggestion I do have is there is a schedule that goes through August. And I know we're at the beginning of September, but I have no clue what the hours are for the fall. So that'd be something. I do like a two-month schedule. But even nearby, having the, the, volley, the sand volleyball, even the sports court, it, sport court is really awesome. You know, we did find Parrot Park when we were driving around. I didn't pronounce that right, aren't I? Okay. Um, and, and it is wonderful. You know what my first thing is? Oh, my gosh. I've always wanted to learn stand-up paddle boarding. This would be fantastic. Because this is not going to get the waves and everything, I don't think, that like the reservoir might get. And so I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if you had a park concessionaire that rented out maybe kayaks, canoes, maybe they rent out the stamp paddle boards and give people lessons. This is one of the fastest growing hobbies in the U.S. and Canada. As a matter of fact, can you imagine out at Parrot Park, if you did this, this is paddle board yoga. I just, I just went and I said, I wonder how many people, five seconds out of this picture were taken, went, poop. <laughs> but think of the cool things you could do. And so I just kept thinking, wow, wouldn't that be cool? Competitive swimming, diving. So I had to stand up paddle boarding. I mean, maybe that's an opportunity. You know, another big thing is dragon boats. I mean, I don't know if they do them out here, but that reservoir, the way it's shaped, right there, you could even host... Dragon boat races out here would be awesome. So I just kept thinking, man, for, for it's kind of ingrained in who you are. And so I thought maybe you could do some of these kinds of things. I mean, how does that look like fun? These are, these are Hobie cats. And you know what? I know that left bridge has a lot of wind. Do you have a lot of wind? Does the reservoir get windy? Oh, yeah. I, this would be fantastic. 
You know, but, but either way, I don't want you to use the tagline that they used in Pincher Creek, which I said, really? They have billboards that, this is a long time ago, that said, welcome to Pincher Creek, let us blow you away. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, I'm not so sure. I know you're trying to be cute and clever, but I don't know that you want to promote wind is why we should live there. But if you can take advantage of it doing these things, I think it'd be fantastic. I mean, I could just see Hobie Cat races and wind sports. And you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if you had an outfitter, a shop here where they could rent gear, buy gear, so that you could monetize the reservoir or even Parrot Park better? You know, one thing we loved on the first day of school is this is in front of the grade school. Look at the number of kids that are riding their bikes to school. That is cool. And I love the fact that these are the little kid bikes. Right next door are the big kid bikes in front of the junior high school. Look at the number of kids that are riding bikes to school. However, when you get over to the high school, we got a few. Most of them are now graduated to cars. But what was really cool is we saw them coming to school, first day of school. And I'll bet you on the first day of school, some of these kids probably came with their parents. And in other days, they will ride bikes. But what was really cool is even after school, we were driving around after school, and, and um, we were going down one of the streets south, from the, just from the school, and I'm looking in my rear view mirror, and I see a young girl, probably fourth grade or so, on a bike, waving goodbye to her friend on a bike, and she starts going across the traffic. And there was an SUV coming down, and I'm going, Oh, oh, oh. But of course, people are used to it here. And that SUV, not a problem. They were going three or four miles. They didn't honk. They just let their girl get over to the other side. Then she turned around. She went, <gasps> <laughs> and so it's cool when the, when the community gets it. I thought that was a great thing. So then there's another really, really fast growing sport that is taking Canada by storm, and you are leading the way, and this is called foot golf. And, yeah. And, and this is so cool because golf is the fastest declining sport in the United States and Canada. This is a way to bring it back. And this is different than disc golf where you throw frisbees because this is actually takes place on a golf course. And I want to try it. But you know what? I can't buy a soccer ball in Raymond. That's, you know what? You're not monetizing things. I mean, how cool is that? And your golf course is building this in. It's awesome. And so, I look, notice the different, color, the different color soccer balls so you can keep track of whose is whose. You know, I mean, this is so cool. And Raymond, you can, you're, you're already working on this. You're already working with the PGA on getting certified and doing all of that. I mean, I just think it's so cool. And so I thought, okay, we got to put foot golf in there. Now, one thing I will tell you is that we did eventually find the golf course. However, when you drive up to the gates, it says no trespassing. Now, it doesn't say no trespassing over there where there's a private drive. It's over here on the golf course entrance. Is there another entrance to the golf course? Then why do you have no trespassing? But this sign has been here for years. Has the golf course been being worked on for years? See what I mean? By the way, you can, you can close the gates. So anyway, I just want to make sure that you remember that when it opens, I know it's being worked on, it's fantastic. We got the grand tour. But, but, um, but I would just, you know, just remember to take that down because that's not, you know, you want this to be cool. You want this to be a place people go to. Um, and over there, we got, oh, by the way, uh, no dogs. Dog people can read, so they can read no dogs. But if you're on a snowmobile, you can't read, so we just put a symbol there. And I was a snowmobiler. So I know we can't read. So, um, but this is, uh, 
you know, you're, this is you here. I mean, first of all, I love the driving range. This is, you know, I've seen thousands of golf. I love that with the golf, with the golf carts kind of half buried out there. I thought that was really cool. Now I saw these nets and I didn't realize, I thought, hey, these must be where you hit the soccer ball. So you can use this to try to get it. You know, and, and it's actually meant for golf balls because you don't have quite the depth of some. So it's more for like target practice. Um, and I love the fact that you even have a, a, a satellite dish out there. And if you're good enough, you'll hear them, tink, tink. You know, I don't know if I could ever hit it. But I thought that was a really, really great driving range. When we were done with the assessment, we did have Greg take, give us on a tour out to the golf course. And you know, he, he made a comment that I loved. He said, you know, Roger, this is nine holes. It's kind of a municipal golf course. We could try to expand it to 18 holes, but we wouldn't be different. But if we could be the best nine hole course in Alberta, people will skip over similar ones to come here. And that is exactly what you want to do. I mean, this course is phenomenal. Do you realize you have five water features out there? Water traps? Most 18 old courses may have two. I mean, this course, look at this. This is actually a T right here where you have to hit it over the water. I mean, I just think that is so cool. You know, if that was me, there'd probably be a lot of balls in here and I'll finally get one over there. But we just thought this is so amazing what you're doing here. And so, you know what, you add foot golf, I think you'd add golf here. This would be a great course. And by the way, this is not a par three course. This is like half of an eight, this is par 36 or so. I mean, it is really a great. And by the way, yeah, absolutely a fantastic name. Hell's great. <laughs> now, love it. You know what? When you say, oh, we have the Raymond Municipal Golf Course or Raymond Public Golf Course, people automatically think, eh, low quality. This makes it an attraction, not just a local amenity. Now, I know some people may say, oh, no, no. we had the same problem. We, we did the branding for Ogden, Utah. It's the least LDS town or Mormon town or, okay, Latter-day Saint town in Utah. As a matter of fact, Al Capone said, it's a little too rowdy for my taste when talking about Ogden. When we went to Ogden, we would ask people, what do you think of Ogden? Every, almost everybody that was young said, I freaking love it here. So that became their tagline, I freaking love it here. But you should have seen, oh, freaking, freaking, I mean, how close are I? Oh, I think this is awesome. My, my, my deal was, hell yeah. It's cool because you know what? It gets our attention. And by the way, if I was playing this course, that creek meanders through it and I would be going, this certainly is hell's creek. My balls are always down there. And so I thought that was really cool you're doing that. Make it an attraction. And you know what? If you did that, we'd be buying this logo gear like crazy. This is, I'm big into the word monetize it. Monetize it. So if you had, you know, you could even do I Survived Hell's Creek Golf Course. You know, you could do so much fun with this. And so, I think it'd be great. And, and by the way, wouldn't it be great if the people from Lethbridge came here more often than you go there? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, now, the next step I want you to do, I want you to go rename the Aquatic Center. And it doesn't have to be Hell's Pools. We don't even need to use the word hell in this one. But I want you to make, because aquatic center sounds like a local amenity. You know, so I'll give you an example. We were working in Moses Lake, Washington. It was the Moses Lake Aquatic Center. They added one of those surf riders. It's where you stand place and you can surf. They changed the name of it to Surf and Slide Water Park. You know what happened is? The revenues went up 400% because it was an attraction not just an aquatic center. So think of a cool name for your aquatic center. Do that too. Particularly if it's open to the public. 
And so, besides just locals. So anyway, they did that. It's cool. So, and um, we also saw the stampede, the grounds. They look immaculate. Um, I mean, I kept going, should this be a question? Should that be? A... And I thought, well, you know what? As things get developed and, and you start losing some of that, then, you know, maybe it is more the sport. But you know what? This is a sport too. And so we kept going, you know, this is, you know, I, I use that. If, if This is a place for ultra, ultra active families. Is that a fair statement? I, it just seems like that's what this is about, you know? And this is in Moses Lake, they used to jump in, you know, everything they did was that. And so I think doing something along that lines will be great. You know, when it comes to marketing, I kept saying, so some people come, some, some stay in Raymond for the love of foot golf. Some come for the love of tennis. Some come for the love of swimming and diving. Some come for the, the, the love or the, you know, catching a trophy walleye. Some come for the thrill of motocross or BMX. Some come for the thrill of dragon boat racing, Hobie cats. Some stay for the love of judo. You know, I mean, with all of this and more, there's good reason why everybody loves Raymond. You know, and I saw that used and I thought, yeah, you should leverage that but have fun with it. At the end of the day, what sets you apart from everyone else? And I know you're not the only one with trails and with biking and an active community, but you know what? There were more people that had, boat, had biking more than Devon, but Devon was the first community to claim it. When you're the first to something, you own it. And so what sets you apart? What is the product that backs it up? How do you tell the world and the to-do list. And this is something you could do yourself. So down the road, you could come up with, because brands aren't about taglines, but I could just see you do a little, look like a champion, you know, win every day. I mean, whatever it is, Alberta's team building. You could do all building the future, building future champions here. I mean, be, be more, do more. I mean, now that's a little close to can more, which did say something similar to that. But you know, dare to be great. Whatever it is for the love of sport, what's yours? You know, I just think all of these things could play up. You know, I would love to see down the road, if you decide to go this way, this we saw in Cornerbrook in Newfoundland. I could just see people doing team building and you have all these organizations coming out here. You know what it does? It gives you credence for a hotel. <laughs> and and uh, right now it's not really feasible, you know, but it could be. So chapter number five, I want to get back to that. So we covered branding a little bit. When we were in town, we absolutely we saw the state center and a couple of war buildings, but we also noticed that you had a Mennonite church, you have the Hutterite communities here, um, you had the, the, the uh, is this Buddhist? Yeah, was, was that, you had the Baptist church. I mean, I just love the fact that you're not so LD. There's people in Utah that just go, it's just too much. And so I thought it was really cool that you're a welcoming community. Um, love the, the museum. Um, one of our challenges at the museum is we have a lot of signs there. I think I would reduce these down. And part of the problem is that summer hours are here. I don't know when summer hours end. So I would actually use dates. Our summer hours are from long weekend in May to Labor Day or whatever it is. Because while we're here, I have no idea when or if it's ever open. And there was nothing that told me so we would come back. So we never got in the museum. And I don't know, is it even open now? It's not. It is. See, you don't even know. It is open. When is it open? Wednesdays. What time? Wednesday after. See, even as you just put open every Wednesday in the afternoon. Um, and that would be great. And I love the fact they did this for back to school. That's right out in front. I thought that was awesome. Um, back over here, um, I always say this is the Heri Agriculture Society heritage. Does anything happen here? Or here? What? Okay, so it's available for private events. Is there anything open to the public happen here? Okay, besides Aggie Days, that's it? 
Not a right. Okay. But, but I was just thinking, you know, right here we promote the organization. You don't promote anything that ever takes place here. Now, Aggie Days, we did see it. It was on the sign coming into town. We did see posters around town like you saw at the museum. But if it had more, I'd put a reader board out there. I think this building is absolutely fantastic. Um, we thought, I think, was this a tabernacle, you know, back then? But it's just a beautiful building. The fact that it has theater in it. Um, we, were, we were just like, wow. And it's great that you have the interpreter sign that tells you about first chapel, second chapel, how this all worked. Um, I would love to see you do, so in your theater, how many productions are done in this room a year? Okay, so schools do one in March. Is there, but I thought somebody said you had a professional or semi professional theater company. Okay, and when is the one a year? In March. Okay, and what did you do this last March? Uh, all shook up, shook up. All shook up. Do you know what's going to happen next March? A little bit Okay, how come we didn't see any posters, any information anywhere about why we should come back and come to this facility? This is fabulous, by the way. <laughs> so, and you might be working on it, but I, always, I just want everybody to always say, give me a reason to come back. So if you start saying coming in March of 2019, Little Mermaid, and here's our website, would be fantastic. Always invite people to come back. Because it's fantastic that you have this. You know what? Not very many small communities have cultural depth, and that's something you have. Even the library here we thought was charming and great. And so we, you know, remember our first drive-in coming down that road? All of a sudden, we're going, this is great. This is fantastic. And so I called your downtown the hole in the middle of the donut. <laughs> this is why when we're done doing these, we have to get out of town really quick. <laughs> Here's the challenge. It's the weak link, but it could become a great destination for locals and visitors. Because right now, I mean, there's some good things about it. I want to talk about the importance of downtowns for a minute. So this is going to be my second little side trip besides branding. Is the heart and soul of any community besides its people is its downtown. You need to bring it to life. And by the way, downtowns are back and more important than ever. You know what? Suburban malls everywhere are dying. Everywhere. I mean, the one in Lethbridge seems to be doing fine. Um, but... Across the country, they're dying. And look at this. In economic development, tourism, community development, there's absolutely, positively nothing that's more important than your downtown because that is where spending takes place. And by the way, thinking beautification, facade improvements will fix the downtown. It's what's in the buildings that makes you great. So we have a set of videos. And by the way, you have been watching these. We, we would love to see you watch more. We did a whole series of these for you to watch about downtowns because I would love to spend all day on it, but we just don't have the time. But here's the deal. Here is how downtowns are different. Is first of all, downtowns, the future of downtowns is where we go after work, after school, and on weekends. That means key hours are like 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Yet your shops are closing at five and six. I, that right there. And by the way, here's another one for you. 70% of all retail spending takes place after 6 p.m. now. Bricks and mortar. We're not talking Amazon. Bricks and mortar. 70% takes place after 6 p.m. And whether we're here as tourists or whether we're here as locals and we go to work and we come home, you're closed. No wonder we do all of our shopping in Edmonton. I mean in Lethbridge, excuse me. That would be a long drive to Edmonton for shopping. <laughs> So, so you see what I mean? When they come home from work, we've seen rush hour out of town every morning. And when they come back, you're closed. This is the future of downtowns. So that's number one. Number two, downtowns have what we call the 10-10-10 rule. That is 10 places with a food focus. We counted three. Maybe four if you count gas stations. 
Yes, I heard about that. I went, yes, because you're going to see that coming up. And destination retail shops. And out of those 20, 10 open after six. Number three. Okay, what comes first? People downtown on a consistent basis, 250 days a year. So we need you to do a lot of events. I'm kidding. But 250 days a year. If you, could, if you had 100 people downtown in the evening hours, 250 days a year, you'd have no vacancies and your business would be doing way, way better as long as they're open. And so we even have how to get people downtown 250 days a year. Public plazas. I'm going to talk about this one. Year-round public markets. All of these things can work. So, number four. It's what's in the buildings is just as important as facade improvements and beautification. Here's the other thing. I gave you that one statistic. 70% of first-time sales come from curb appeal. We all travel. Have you ever said these words? That looks like a nice place to eat. Your Chinese restaurant? You couldn't pay me enough to walk in there from its curb appeal. No offense. That's how we judge the book by the cover. Number five. You only need one block. You've got two, but you have one key block just north of here that I think would be an amazing place to start. And so, here's the deal. If you don't hang out in your own downtown, neither will visitors. It, when you have friends and family come and visit you, and you head to Lethbridge, then that's what visitors are going to do. They go where you go. And number seven, your downtown must have a focus. If you're about kids and family, where do we put the carousel downtown? or the splash pad, or if you want to be about nightlife, where do we put the microbrew? That won't work here well at are a dry town. <laughs> but if you're about music, where can we bring in the musicians? If we're about antiques, this is Jefferson, Texas, population 2100. In their downtown, they have more than 20 plus antique stores and an antique dealer for every 100 residents. And people drive four and a half hours to do their antiquing in Jefferson. I mean, whatever you're about, Berea, Kentucky, population 15,000, they have 22 galleries. What is your focus? I mean, this is Canmore. If you're going to be about healthy living, mountain sports, wellness, you know what? Look at all the businesses they have that all support the brand. I mean, their, their Nordic Center, I, the bike racks downtown, the Fit Center. I mean, it goes on and on and on because that's what they're about and the retail comes. So when you're known for something, then you're gonna get the retail shops and, and things that support it. So, here's five things I would like you to do in downtown Raymond, okay? Number one, I would narrow Broadway for these two blocks. Here's what I would do. We are not taking, I, my first thing is how do we get the parking out of the middle of the street? But then I thought, you know what? I don't think that's really necessary. It's still too wide. And I kept going, could we, you want an intimate setting. And so I thought, could you do something like this where you just, you just put in like a six foot, sorry, speaking feet and inches, a couple meters, a little less than a couple meters. You put in a strip like this and you put street trees and you put in landscaping anything to do this, and you still have your parallel parking, just move it out a little bit. Here's what you need to know. Congestion is the downtown's very best friend. You don't want people to blow through downtown. You want them to come to downtown. So we're not talking about a lot, just a little bit, just to make it a little more intimate. And if you did landscaping here, this is Innisfail. What they did. So what they did is they never, now they have parallel parking, which I don't want you to do. Angle and parking is great. But you have wide enough streets because of that Utah thing that you could do this and still have the angle and parking. But by creating these kinds of things, it makes the sidewalks great. By the way, we did a seven-year research project of 2,000 cities and downtowns in 2,000 cities and towns in the U.S. and Canada. 
And out of those, we picked 400 of the most successful. Camor was one. I'm trying to think of some other ones. Um, uh, uh, White Ave in Edmonton, Old Strathcona. I mean, there's some other ones. Um, all 400 of them had a narrow main street. All 400. Number two. This is the most important. You need to recruit a stronger mix. You are way, way, way underserved in terms of retail. We were shocked that you had two restaurants and one's closed. Uh, three, if you, uh, but one's closed right now. I don't know if they're on vacation or what. And, and uh, you know, and yeah, you got the ice cream. I mean, we did eat at Burger Baron. Um, it was fine, you know, but it's, you know, it was fine for once. And we didn't go back. If somebody said you should have had the pizza instead of the burgers. But it's fine. I think it's great. You got to have a burger joint. I think it's great. I think they do a good job with curb appeal. They got picnic tables out front. Um, it's a cute. I love the interior of it. Um, so we ate there and, and no problems. Um, this one here. You know, we, we thought if it would have been open, we would have eaten there, even though we did not want to walk in. And this is rated number one, but I told Jane, I said, but the bar is pretty low. I hate to say it. Because when we would talk to local residents here, we'd say, when you go out to dinner, where do you go? Nobody said one of these restaurants. They all said Lethbridge. Or we go to Moxie's. We go to, I mean, they just started listing them. And so, and then by the way, we went up there and we're open September 17th. So, so I don't know if they're on vacation or whatever. It certainly limited our dining choices. And we did go over here and we did have ice cream. But even there, she had to get all the stuff off of the freezer, you know, pull out the ice creams, then scoop us up. She was very gracious, very nice about it, but it's really not set up that way, um, as you probably all know. Um, and she got a lot of stuff in there. And so, but if, she, if I, I think we walked by and saw ice cream on, a, on the window. Oh yeah, you see the ice cream cone there. Um, we did eat at Subway. Um, and and um, our office when we were in the Seattle area had a Subway right next door and I ate at Subway so many days that was like, oh, I kind of OD'd on Subway. But we did come there for breakfast. So we, would, we tried to eat as many meals here as we could but don't you, as you, have, you know what? You serve an area of 5,100 people, 5,000 people. You have a downtown that I see in towns of 400 people. Which means everything you do, everything you spend is in Lethbridge, pretty close. And I'll bet you as locals would love to see more of this downtown. But everybody's just so used to it, that's just what they do. I think you need to reverse that. First of all, you need a bakery, cafe, and ice cream shop combination. Now, I heard you have a tea shop coming. Is it a bakery? It's going to have a bakery in there. Yeah, so if it'll have fresh bread, fresh baked, uh, not, so not just pastry, but if it had actually a bakery with cafe that made paninis and things like that, and then ice cream would be fantastic. If that's coming... Fantastic, because it's right at the top of our list of what you need. Okay? It's going to operate uh, and, and have a little bit of the So right across from the Burger Baron, right? Somewhere in there. Fantastic. So you could even use three more sit-down restaurants, eateries, those kinds of things. These are, we're not trying to be fine dining. You need choice. You have 5,000 people that would probably like to eat more meals out here and not have the same two choices or coming up three or four choices. I'm going to take you to Okotoks because we've been working in Okotoks. Number one, I love the colorful banners and everything they do. But even this little place, every town needs a third place, the place where we go hang out. This here is this home ground. It's a little espresso bar, coffee house. Um, I got hot chocolate when I was in there. But these kinds of places just gravitate. People come and they hang out there. You know what? I thought, I want to live in that. Or this would be a great restaurant. And I saw that it's for sale. I saw how much it was. I went, oh my gosh, here's a great opportunity. 
If we go back to Okotoks, there's church. This was the coolest place we ate in Okotoks. It's not a church anymore, obviously. It is a restaurant. It's got, they did a little outdoor cafe dining, which you could easily do in front of this, the one that's just, where is it? Just, oh, just up the street, a block or so, and do this. And by the way, how cool is that? Awesome. So it's another opportunity for you. Um, you know, and, and I just think, I, I would love to see that. Even if you had, so you have Subway, the Chinese, Burger Bear, and you've got the one that's coming. Um, even, even if you could, you know what? In a town of the size, you should have 10. 10. Believe it or not, 10. And I'm going to get to more into that. And I know people say, if you bring in the competition, we're never going to survive. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. You could use a home accent store. You've got lots. You know what? People are moving here. They're living here. Somebody that had home accents with some interior design would do really well. Now, downtowns are never going to be, you're never going to outcompete Amazon. Just so you know, here's the sound bite I always use. We are moving away from Macy's to Etsy. Those are the kinds of shops we want in our downtowns. We can't buy that stuff on Amazon. And so doing this would be great. Now, I know that Farmer Save has some home accents, but what we, and it actually they have a pretty good collection of stuff. But it's not, if you still wanted, and I think this is great because it's got gifts and things in there. So I think they do a good job, but you're still being underserved as a community of 5,000 people. You know, this is back in Okotoks. They have Boot Hill. People come from ever, they come from Calgary to go to Boot Hill to go shopping. That's home accents. And so I think that would be great. One thing you could really use is an outfitter that isn't just about outfitting, but they might sell bikes. They might sell sports gear, like those soccer balls. You know, when people are playing foot golf, they wear the long soccer socks. You ought to go on Google and just look at images, and you'll see the kind of things that people would love to buy here. You know, I mean, you could really use this. Um, antiques, not just secondhand store, but antique stores would be great. A florist, a gift shop. I don't know, maybe you have that one. I can't remember. Um, I mean, I know the hardware store, you know, which, by the way, I love the hardware store. Um, and I think it's so cool. I'm glad it's downtown. It has a little bit, but it's just not, you're still being underserved. And so we actually did a video that's in our library that talks about what the business mix should be. Now, I thought, okay, here, and I'm going to tell you what I put in there. Towns are 2,535. I didn't even go to 5,000 because... Lethbridge is pretty close. So I thought whatever could work in a town of 25 to 3,500 would work here. And this is that list. There's your, a couple of coffee shops. Now, in your case, you say, what do you do with the coffee shop, the bakery, and the cafe? You could combine some of these. This is in typical towns of 25 to 35. Five sit-downs, two burger houses, two casual clothing shops, two home accents, two delis. I mean, you see it's going here. This is proven on research that these are the things that could sustain a town, that these will all be sustainable. So, now, you just need to get started on something. And so, I mean, pet grooming, you know, boarding, gym, fitness, studio, which you, I think you have out at the park. Um, but these are all things there. For you, this is Subway Tuesday morning. Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, maybe not Sunday morning, but then Monday morning they're back. But the thing is, the thing is, people want a place they can go hang out. And I have no problem with them hanging out at Subway, but wouldn't it be cool if you had other options? And so we saw Bill and say, I have no idea what this even is. Was this a hotel or something? What? 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 It used to be a firehouse. Oh, firehouse? What is it now? Somebody's house or is it a just? Residence. It's a residence. Okay. They were going to have a restaurant. It never happened. Okay. So, now, I know this is bigger scale. When people say, if you bring another restaurant, we're all going to die. I hear this competition thing all the time. Are you joking? You know what? Canmore's a, Canmore's a top population of 10,000 and they have 24 restaurants. And so, I want to show you one example. 
This is in Halifax. I know it's a bigger city, but we're just talking about Argyle Street, which nobody lives on. There, has anybody ever, does anybody know Argyle Street in Halifax? Okay, one or two. That's the Prince George Hotel is there. It is steep. They have a waterfront that is, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars redeveloping the waterfront in Halifax. And if you walk up a very steep hill, three blocks, you'll end up on Argyle Street. There was lots of vacancies, uh, like 60% vacancies. And then the challenge was, why would anybody go up that hill and leave the waterfront? And so that was their brand. Why should we bother? But a guy owned a restaurant called Opa. It's right up here. It is a Greek restaurant. And the only other restaurant there is across the way at Subway. He decided, I want to turn Argyle Street into Restaurant Row. Why would he do this? He'd have all this competition. So he went to property owners and he would say, would you give, if I bring a restaurant into your property, would you give them a good deal? I just need to keep them alive for the first couple of years till I get enough restaurants that people will gravitate here. And so he did that with the vacant spaces. Then pretty soon the guy that owned the insurance agency says, yeah, you know what? I'm going to move upstairs and I'll let you put a restaurant in my space. Then he went to the city. This was all parallel parking. He said, city, our sidewalks are too narrow. We want to get rid of the parking so we could have people, pedestrians could walk around these like this. The city said, look, if you're willing to give up the parking, they're going to have to park down at the waterfront. They're going to have to park on the top of the hill and walk down to you. If you're okay with that, we'll lease you the spaces for a buck a year. Or maybe it was a buck a month. And it'll fall under your insurance. And so then the restaurant, he started recruiting restaurants in. And they started creating these little homemade places where they could walk around so that they could fill a sidewalk full of cafe dining. In the winter, they pack it all up. They put it in a shared warehouse for snow removal. And you know what? It started working. And he recruited another restaurant and another restaurant. There's Opa right down there at the end. This is where he started all. He started recruiting restaurants all the way down here. I, I mean, you know, and it was pretty homemade. But you know what? It worked. And all of a sudden, the place is absolutely packed. It started spreading down the hill, around the corner. My favorite restaurant, Five Fishermen. They even go and look at how steep it is. Look at the, they have to do these terrace decks. And you know what? In Halifax, their plans were to build a $400 million office, convention, hotel on the waterfront. Well, you know what? They built it on Argyle Street. And this is Argyle Street today. There it is. And this is Argyle Street today. Now, I went back to OPA a couple years later after he did all this and said, there was you and Subway. You had no competition. You now have 21 competitors. How's that working for you? You know what he said? Roger, I own four of them. <laughs> and another guy owns three of them. And I said, yeah, but what about OPA? He goes, it does 10 times the business it ever did before. We would love to live in Lethbridge if we, were, if, if we lived in Lethbridge, we would love more than, we would love to come out to Raymond for a restaurant that is worth a 20 minute drive out in the country in this setting. But even when we talk to people in Lethbridge about coming out to Raymond, they would say, yeah, we come out there for a game. We come out there for theater. We come out there, but there's no place to eat. Even though you have these three choices, that's every single person, that's what they said, there's no place to eat. I said, well, there's a few places. They said, oh, and then they say, oh, there's no good place to eat because they want something other than chains. Once again, I'm not taking anything away from Subway. I'm thrilled that it's here. It fills a need that you have. But competition, if you had 50 restaurants here, you'd have people coming out here from Calgary. You know what? You want another example? How many of you have been down to the town of Rosebud? Raise your hand. A lot of you. You know what? You know what the population is in Rosebud? 88. 
Everywhere I go in Alberta, I said, Roger, you got to go out to Rosebud. So you're way underserved. So Argyle Street, by the way, 22 restaurants in two and a half blocks. It is the major gathering spot. It rivals the waterfront. It's the place to hang out. It's the third place. By the way, third place. First place is the place we live. It's our home. Second place is where we work. Third place is the place we hang out. It is the th ingredient that Raymond is missing. The third place. Where do we go to hang out? And so restaurants are all doing very, very well. Convention Center opened last year. So you need to orchestrate some more business mix. Next thing for your retailers. They need to use blade signs. Blade signs are perpendicular to us. When we're driving down Broadway or when we're walking down the sidewalks, we see signs that are perpendicular to us. And by the way, if I go back to this one, chocolate, collectibles, trains, restaurant, it's easy to tell what it is they're selling. That's in Nantucket. This is in Carmel, California. This is in Canmore. Am I rubbing Canmore in your face enough? But, but look at it. I mean, it's just easy. Kitchen boutique. There's even, there's some sign sizes for you. Even Lethbridge. These are built 100 mile an hour, sorry to be miles, wind loads because of all the wind there. But you know what? Can you tell me what's in any of those shops? You know, that's the Merck, which by the way, we thought was going to be a mercantile. It's a grocery store. And, and by the way, when we're on that street, I have no clue what's in there. The only way I know what's in there is if I go out in the traffic and look up at the facade. And so for these businesses, just the blade signs, these are a couple hundred dollars. I have no idea what's in any of these businesses. Same here. You know, and by the way, if you use sandwich boards, you don't have near the need to put out these, I mean, if you had blade signs, you wouldn't need to put out as many sandwich boards. Does that make sense? So this is something you could do. I don't know what's in these businesses. And by the way, in this case, it says open, and there's all these really pretty painted clay fixtures and stuff in here. But I have no idea what this business is because over here, this is accounting and real estate. So I don't know if there's a real business in there. We walked in, we could see a back room that had lots of clay, unpainted clay figures. I don't know if it's a paint your own. What is the place? Shop. It's a shrimp. There's no signs. How does anybody know? So those are the kinds of things that business, if you say, but Roger, you want us to recruit more business. Our business is here, barely making it. Well, I mean, how, how would we know? Because all of these, the only way I know what's in them is if I'm across the street. And walking across Broadway is not that fun. Here's the next one, beautification. So, beautification pays. And I love the, what you did here with the clock tower. And I would love to see this whole island here turn into a planting bed. Even if it's river rock and some junipers or something that's evergreen. But see the little planting bed down there where those arrows are? I like each one of those to be landscaped. At first, I thought, take the whole median, make it landscaping. But I want to make sure you have plenty of parking. And so some businesses do a great job. I think the family dental place with the hanging bass is great. I would love to see them add a row of plants around the foundation. You know, but at least it's a beautiful building. It's, I love the hanging baskets. Um, these shops do a great job. That's really gorgeous. And by the way, benches are so important. And I'm going to talk about benches in a minute. But see there, we got the bench there. There should be another one right there. You should have benches. You know what? When I was working in Cardston, they said, Roger, we have Aboriginal people, we have six benches that are downtown and they accommodate all six benches and it's bad news. Because this group of people is always asking for handouts, the panhandling. And I said, but I want you to put out 30 benches. And they went, oh my God, you just ruined our town. And I said, no, I'll tell you what, I want you to put out 10 more benches and if they accommodate, if they take up all the benches, I'll pay for them. 
You know what? They called me back about three months later, said, Roger, we put out the benches. They never took more than the six. And now we had enough people in the other 10 that it just wasn't as big an issue as it was before. And as a matter of fact, they said, now they're, because we have more people hanging out downtown, that group is starting to go elsewhere. So benches are always great. One statistic, women account for 80% of all consumer spending. That is true. I'm waiting. <laughs> Usually there's a guy in the audience that says, that's all. <laughs> and most of them would say, gratefully so. However, I want you to look at this next photo, which was not staged. What do you see? The guys are right now saying, oh, been there, done that. You know what? It's the guys sitting on the benches, the wives are in shopping. And by the way, I have two words for you. Think benches. Why do you think that we put front porch swings? We may never sit in those chairs, but it makes our home feel welcome. Benches should always be at the facade facing out. You should have benches all along Broadway in front of your retail shops and flank every bench with a pot. It just makes your business feel welcome. I love it when businesses extend window displays, take exterior spaces to the hardware store. I love it when a hardware store will take the time to do beautification. They're a hardware store. But they also sell gifts, they sell bikes, they sell all this kind of stuff. I love the fact that they take the time to do this every morning. So extend window displays to exterior spaces. Because back here, it is as stark as can be. We got the bench, but we have no beautification. And so all of these retail shops just look, I mean, down there, you see it looks really pretty. And by the way, the city, the town has certainly done its part with street trees, um, with some street trees, with beautification along there. But facade should always be softened. Shops like this, we didn't know whether the shop is in business or out of business because there's nothing that makes it obvious. There's no blade signs, there's no, it's hard to read uh, even the font. And so if I go back to Canmore, <laughs> look at what their bike shop does. I mean, these are downtown Canmore. There's a furniture home accents. Every morning they put that stuff out. I love it when retailers will put out a little table like that. You know, I mean, this is my favorite in Canmore. Isn't that cool? This is actually a mannequin. This is actually a coat rack that they made into kind of a mannequin. And then every morning, the shop owner puts all of those things out there. It just says, we're open, and invites you in. So I think you need to do more of that. And this gets back to that other quote I said. 70% of first-time sales comes from curb appeal. That looks like a good shop. Let's go in. And by doing this, every morning that merchant puts those out there. I mean, this is a restaurant up in Banff, so we know what the menu is. You know, I mean, this is in Laverne, Minnesota, a town your size. Two pots, and they put a little metal chair and a couple chairs, and it's not even a restaurant. They just do it to make it seem welcoming. And the merchant next door did this. So when it comes to this, if your merchants would do these things, I think you'd even see more local sales. You know, and, and by the way, this isn't a small town about your size. The city does the street curb. This is the facade side. There's nothing to stop it. This is before, after. Retail sales went up 35% just doing that. So here's an idea for you. This is in Fredericksburg, Texas. It's a small town too. It's about 12,000 people. What they did is they did a cool thing. Is they went to, they went downtown to every merchant and stuff and they would go, we want to add pots. Like in your case, every meter. We want to add pots every meter, every three feet up and down their street. And they said, what we want you to do <clears throat> is donate whatever you can. So somebody gave them five bucks, somebody gave them 20, somebody gave them 200. Their average donation was 40 bucks. So when they got their money, it was a couple thousand dollars total. They had more merchants than you. Um, so they ended up with a little bit of money. They went to a wholesale nursery 
and they said, when it comes to October, it's the end of the season, we want you to, uh, we want you to sell us your leftover pots. If they have a hairline crack, we'll take them. If they have a chip on, we take them. We want them at dirt cheap prices. They don't have to match. They just have to be 21 inches opening across or bigger. So we didn't want a bunch of little pots. And so at the end of the season, what they did is they got these pots, they put them on a flatbed truck, came over, put them on a side street, said, merchants, help yourselves. They didn't say, you only pay $5, you only get one. They just said, help yourselves. So this merchant here grabbed these down here. This merchant grabbed these that kind of match. You can see down here, these are a little bit different. This merchant grabbed these two, and they just started lining them up. Then what they did, after they got them all lined up, they put a pile of gravel, uh, some rolls of landscape fabric, and, and a dump truckload of topsoil, and they went to youth organization, high school, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, cheerleaders, football, any hockey, any kind of group that you had, and they said, we want you to plant the pots. So they put in soil, then they put a layer of landscape fabric, or they put in the rock, then the landscape fabric, then the soil, and they did that through all of these. Then what they did, because it was winter time, they filled them full of pinwheels, you know, so it made all this motion and everything. Some of them had dried flowers and things. And then in the spring, they plant them with mainly evergreens. There were some pots left over. Does that make you want to go in? Blade sign, beautification, there were pots left over. Does it make you want to just walk in there? Those are things you could do. You know what? It made all the difference in the world. That small town has the highest per capita retail sales of any city in the state of Texas. Pretty cool. So, other things you do, a little pop-up things like this, where you allow, whether it's a food truck. By the way, food trucks are big. Now, I hear restaurants, you bring a food truck, you're going to compete with my restaurant. I go to restaurants, I say, so do you compete with McDonald's? They go, well, of course not. I said, then you don't compete with food truck. It's a different thing. It's a different experience but you can bring them in and out. But this is in a small little town of Vernal, Utah, where they allowed this, and they actually brought this in on a it's, a, it's basically a storage barn, like a garden shed, and they brought it in on a pallet, and they put it there, and they, they were there for the whole summer. But even here, we were looking at the auto dealership, they do a nice job, but if I go back to Vernal, Utah, look what they did in front of their dealership. Now, the city did some of this, they added in some lawn, but beautification pays. While we're on that subject, even somebody should adopt this. I mean, it needs paint. I thought Eagle Scout, uh, while we still have scouts, um, you know, fewer posters, clean it up. Some of the stuff in there is way outdated. Um, it's just kind of a mess, and it's not a good first impression, no offense. You know, even putting like these, we just took this last week, we were in Ohio, Dublin, Ohio, and, they, and we loved what they did by putting those kind of planters up and down the street. And by the way, I hear this all the time, Roger, we're in Alberta, you don't know what our winters are like. We can't do beautification in the winter. Well, guess what? This is Port Elgin in Ontario. I mean, this is Aaron, a little town smaller than yours in December. Um, I mean, this is also in the town of Aaron. Look at those. Aren't those fabulous? There's just no excuse why you can't beautify business in the winter months. You know? And this is Elora, um, which is in that area, Wellington County in Ontario. And so, we'd love to see street trees come all the way up and down the street. I mean, you see one there, and I think there's one or two other ones. But you know what? There was a study done in the States where they took four towns and they said, okay, here's what we want to do. We want you to put street trees in. They had no street trees. We said, we want you to put street trees in one block every 30 feet. So every 10 meters or so, every nine meters. And so what they did is they put these in there. Then they watched the retail sales in that block. The retail sales in this block with the street trees went up 18% on average over these four towns with no other changes. 18% more than the rest of the blocks in the downtown, just by adding street trees. I've heard merchants say, you put in the street trees, they're going to block my signs and all that, and it's all unfounded. It creates shade in the summer, you light them up in the winter, it makes downtown a great destination. And then the fifth one is we would love to see you do some cafe dining. 
I mean, all, a couple, if, if this, I mean, I'm not sure sure about this place, but anything, just put a couple little cafe tables and chairs. This is in Kenmore. <laughs> this merchant, if there's nobody eating ice cream, will give somebody ice cream and say, if you'll eat the ice cream out there in those chairs, all of a sudden there's a line coming into the store. All it take, what they have is two tables and four chairs. It's all it does. It pulls the eye towards your retail shops. I mean, you know what? When you create a plaza, I'm getting there. You're going to have a plaza coming. Okay? But you know what? See these tables and chairs? Look, this is overstock.com. Now, this is 162 US, so about $500 Canadian. Not kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I think it's down to like 25% now. But on Overstock.com, for a table and four chairs, $162. And there's an umbrella for 40 bucks. For 200 bucks. And by the way, and I know you get wind. But you know what? Even if the umbrella is down, so it doesn't blow away, you know what? That red, the yellow pulls the eye. It slows traffic. People will notice what you have. But in Kenmore... Once again, I mean, they're the model for small towns. Is All they have is a, a little row of chairs right there. Your sidewalks are wider in your town than they are in Canmore. And, and you wonder about Canmore, you know. And by the way, it has, an, and by the way, this is Cedar City, Utah. There's Jane being my model. But notice a bench and a pot on each side. If you did these things in your downtown, make a huge difference. So if you have business, say, but Roger, you want to bring in more business when we're just barely making it. Well, look at your store. Look at your store. Is it really pulling people in? So my last chapter. You need to program your downtown 250 days a year. How do you do that? You have a parking lot. You know where I'm talking about? That yellow thing would be all paver stones. So you would get rid of the parking in this space. I could go, wow. I mean, granted, you might, I mean, wouldn't it be great if you had a little coffee shop, a restaurant, a, a bakery? Wouldn't it be great if you had things on a plaza? So what if you could take a space like this and make this all paver stones so you get the cars out of there because there's lots of room right behind there for parking. And so you put down this kind of surface, whether it's this surface or whether it's paver stones like this. Because plazas are very simple space that you program with different kinds of activities. So all you have to do, this doesn't have to be ultra expensive. You know, these are paver stones and they, they're on sand and everything, so they drain. We've even seen towns in Canada where they'll actually run wires under them so it melts the snow or ice. And then what we want you to do is said, okay, now what we want you to do is add street trees along here, like every, every nine meters or so. We would even love to see you add street trees in front of these retail shops. Let me go back to that. I went through that really quick. So that you would add these street trees. Now, these street trees should be in raised planters. This is in Whistler Resort. Isn't that great? But I want you to do what Disney does. Your plaza has to be about people. And so Disney, all their trees are in raised planters. But did you notice Notice the raised planter back there. Notice how it's curved. Exactly right. So if you had round raised planters with curves, it creates another place for people to sit and enjoy whatever's going on on the plaza. And you know what? Between those trees, I would put planters like this. You know, across around the world now, terrorists and people are finding ways, well, when they see a crowd, they try to drive into the crowd. But if you put these planters between the street trees, it creates beautification, except for where, you know, except for where people enter, and it would be fantastic. And these can be all moved. They, they move them with like a uh, forklift or something. And so we kept going. And then if you could recruit business mix into these, um, you know, and then you start programming it. So we've got this plaza now. It's all paper stones. We've got street trees. They're in raised planters. All those yellow things you see popped up are all Catalina umbrellas, tables, and chairs. So if you had little restaurants, coffee shops, things in there. And by the way, I think there's like a game store and some other things there. We're not trying to get the, kick them out of downtown. 
Sometimes we have to rearrange the business mix for what makes sense on a plaza, which is generally food, um, you know, ice cream, sandwiches, coffee, uh, uh, regular sit-down restaurants, a little baker, a baker, bakery would be really good in there, um, all these kinds of things. But the trick is with this, then you would add a stage. That red thing that just showed up right there would be a stage. And we have videos that go into all the detail. And it would face west. So you could do concerts, you could do band recitals, you could do dance competition, you do whatever you want. And then those little white things are booths, trade show booths. So you could do a farmer's market there. You could do art fairs. Um, and I'm going to get to what you could do there. Wouldn't it be cool if during the winter months you had an ice rink there? So rather than use your ice rink indoors, which I'm sure is regulation hockey, this is just for, for fun skate, a place for kids to learn how to skate. You know, and then in this case, I just showed it. See, this space could always be reconfigured. So here's your booths out here. They could be selling hot chocolate, ice cream, whatever. And so you could put an ice rink there. I mean, during the winter months. So I put November, December, Christmas tree forest, holiday house. I mean, wouldn't it be cool? These here are on pallets, and they all disassemble, and they go in a warehouse. But so what they did is created Santa's house in this plaza and all these little bavarian theme things. You know what, Steubenville, Ohio did this with nutcrackers. They put them out all winter. If you did that kind of thing, you'd have people coming here from all over Southwest Alberta just to see these. They had people come 150 miles to see all these nutcrackers. You know, wouldn't it be cool if you had, these are built in Quebec. These are in Bryant Park in New York City, but these are built in Quebec and you can move them around. What if you had two or three of those and you let local merchants, artisans put them out during the winter months? How cool would that be? What if you did what they do in Edmonton, Ice on White? Anybody ever been to Ice on White up there in Old Strathcona? Um, you know what? But doing chainsaw, ice carvers. I mean, even doing this. Just doing, I've seen JCs come in and do Christmas trees. They decorate them all up and then they sell them. You know, but you could do this. So what you do is you always program it. You know, and, and this ice rink might be 8,000 square feet, so it's half the size of hockey. You know what? That's bigger than the one in Rockefeller Center. You know, then you could even say, hey, why don't we put out some fire pits? Wouldn't that be cool? So during the winter, you could have fire and people are sitting there watching the kids skating. This is in Rapid City, South Dakota. So this, this oval that you see right here is about 8,000 square feet. They have a splash pad right down there at that end. And during the winter, this is it in the summer. There's their stage up here. That's it in the winter. Now, in their case, they make $130,000 a year just renting ice skates, and they have to dole them out because it gets too packed. Now, you're probably not going to generate that kind of revenue because you're in Canada where kids are born with ice skates. But it shows the power of it. Remember I said downtown 250 days a year. If you had a splash pad 120 days a year and an ice rink 120 days a year, that's 240 or 250 days. It's activity, not events. If you had 100 people in Raymond hanging around downtown 250 days a year, you'd have restaurants and your existing restaurants would be doing three, four, five times the business so a competition wouldn't be a big deal. I mean, can you imagine putting these things out there? And these are all portable. They all operate off of propane tanks. And so then what you could do, you could always program it. We, we assessed Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario a couple months ago, and in their main park, they have exercise equipment. In Canmore, again, they have exercise equipment. This is in the middle of the winter, this stuff is being used. They're wearing their ski gear, and they're down here using all this kinds of equipment. Wouldn't that be cool? See, so this, these could be portable. So you say, okay, for two weeks, we're going to do this. For two weeks, we're going to do this. And all of these things lend me, this is really close to what you are, ultra active community. You know what? You could bring in these things, foosball tables, little game tables in the spring. You know, wouldn't it be cool if you had these? This week, if you had these in your downtown on your plaza, you'd have people come from everywhere. And you know, 
By the way, you can buy these on Amazon for, I think, was it four, 500, 600, about $700 US. So, so, and I, so I don't know what that is in Canada, probably similar. But, but um, I mean, how cool is that? In this case, this is Asheville, North Carolina. I asked them, how often do you end up replacing the chess sets? And they said, well, we've gone to the manufacturer and they give us all their seconds. We never miss chess sets. We never miss chess pieces because of vandalism. Every once in a while, we do find missing pieces and we find them in birds' nests. Birds take them. But, and it's used year round. So can you imagine doing home and garden fairs? and inviting Lethbridge this way. I mean, I just kept going, wow. So whatever you put in there um, would be just, I kept thinking, you got one, two, three, four, five shops, and then whatever's on the other side. I mean, you just program the business mix, and you know what? They will pay more for rent to be there because you're gonna bring customers to their front door 250 days a year. Jenga blocks, you know Jenga blocks where you pull out the block until they fall down, four feet high, 80 bucks. You know, you could do the taste of Raymond or the taste of Lethbridge, but hold it out here. And then you fill that whole thing full of tables and chairs. You could do tailgate parties. You could even bring in food trucks. Wouldn't it be cool for a couple weeks to bring in these? You invite them in. And you know what? You say, you know what? If people come from outside you want to make this priority for businesses here in Raymond, but if you brought in a business from Lethbridge to activate this square, and they say, and we get 10% of your gross proceeds so that we can buy more things to program the site. So it actually creates a revenue stream. And if they bring their food trucks down here, they're going to invite all their friends and relatives down here. This is about activating Raymond so that people have a sense of community. I could see you even doing a food truck festival. Then, I would love to see you go get this. This is called Imagination Playground. These are like Lincoln Logs for you that are old enough to remember Lincoln Logs, but they're made out of foam. And you bring in these Imagination Playground, and kids can sit there and just play with this stuff. This is uh, in one town where they actually have a little splash pad area where they put all these, the blocks. But how cool is that? It's called Imagination Playground. So you bring those in and you set up, you know, during the summer months. Kids just go crazy, well, me too, playing with this stuff. This clam shells up at night, you know, when you close it. Or you can get these, or you can get bins that you put them in. You can even bring in vendors with portable climbing walls. That's what we did at Whistler Resort. They even have vendors that bring in portable zip lines. I mean, how cool is that? And yeah, they charge a couple of bucks, but you know what? A percentage comes back to the town. You're activating your downtown, and they're telling all their friends, they're telling social media what they've got. I think that's just awesome. You can put bocce ball courts. Are you getting enough ideas? All this stuff would always change. So 26 times a year, you would change it. So, but even during ice, you would still have maybe fire pits, you'd still have hot chocolate. And so you have multiple things always interchanging. These are bocce ball courts, portable, in the middle of Indianapolis. This is ping pong tables in downtown New York City. There's even ping pong tables inside the Indianapolis airport. Wouldn't it be cool right here in Raymond if you had yoga on the square every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings? How cool would that be? You bring in a yoga instructor. You'd have people coming from everywhere for that. And they could be doing Zumba's, the big new thing now. And, you know, or Tai Chi, all these things. It's just about a sense of community that you really don't have right now. I mean, you might buy one or two of these kiosks. If you don't get the glass one, these are a lot less expensive. They just fold up at night. And you allow local artists, merchants to use these. I would, you got Lethbridge College. You got all kinds of college. I would start inviting musicians to come out and do street music. Even your high school students could come down and say, I wonder what it's like to be a street musician. And they bring their guitars and accordions. These were high school students. This is the first time they'd ever done that. They said, we wanted to see what it was like. Denver, they bring out pianos. I thought, man, maybe if you had a couple of donated pianos, they cover them up when it rains or snows. Just anything to bring downtown to life. And you do it in this plaza, and I guarantee you, everybody will benefit. I mean, you know, art shows, uh, bringing in artisans in action, uh, 
you know, even performance art like that. And you know, if I go back to Rapid City, they do movies on the square every Monday night. Average attendance, 3,500. Look what somebody wrote. I grew up in Rapid City. It was never as cool as it is now. <laughs> Within two years of them opening up their plaza, Main Street Square, the average age of a person buying a home dropped 12 years. The youth were coming back. And you know what? It doesn't have to be expensive. Look at this plaza area. Now, in this case, there's one, two, three, four, five food trucks. But notice something. This is just a wire reel. These are pallets. Look at what they're sitting on. This is a shoestring budget. So if Plaza doesn't have to be expensive, it's the activities you put on it. You know, in Long Beach, California, they said, we're going to try something. We're going to put six parking spaces. They painted them yellow. They brought in tables and chairs, painted everything yellow. They did this for like $3,000. Then they brought in a food truck. And then they brought in like speakers, comics, other people. And it's, it's just six parking lots, six spaces. And you know what? They tried it. They said, we're going to do it temporarily. It's been four years and never. They were going to take it back down. They said, no, you leave that alone. So, and by the way, somebody might say, oh, but you're going to lose the parking in front of those shops. And you know, when I hear this deal, you take away the parking in front of my store, you're going to kill my business. Wrong. Here's what you say. Are you telling me your business isn't worth walking a block for? Give you a statistic. The average shopper at Walmart parks 160 feet away from the front door. That's average. And that's in feet. That means half of them are parking further than that. They have no problem walking that 160 feet front door and all the way to the back of Walmart to buy a DVD or a Blu-ray. They just walk two blocks. So, in Waterloo, Ontario, they got Shoppers Drug Mart. This is a mall. We got Scotia Bank right here. I mean, the parking is right here. Can you imagine when they said, we want to get rid of that parking? These merchants and everybody in there started screaming bloody murder. They tried it, and it never reopened back up to cars because it was worth walking an extra block for. And by the way, in the winter, that's an ice rink. And they program it. You may need to get a tent every once in a while. I mean, I know that, you know, you can get some wind. This is in Missoula, Montana. Um, Karis Park along the river. That's a permanent structure. And it's pretty cool. Weather can never be a, an impediment to you bringing downtown to life. And you know, once you do this plaza, I would invite others to host their events here. And let me give you a case history. This is in Solvang, California. It's a town of 5,000, about your size. It's a Danish town, Central California. I was there, and there was this car show going on. And there were people everywhere. And so what happened is we found the event organizer. I saw this on the front of the car. It said, first annual wheels and windmills car show. So we found that event organizer and said, okay, why are you hosting your car show here? And I thought he was going to say, oh, because it's a cute Danish town. He said, because their chamber of commerce sent out letters and invited us. I said, that's it? He said, yeah, I think they sent out letters to every car club, every motorcycle club, every quilt guild, every pottery uh, club. They just sent letters out inviting them. I said, but what, did they offer you money to hold your event there? And he goes, no. No, they just, they, they, I, said, what did they, I said, what did they give you? They said they put up welcome signs around town. And they would close off two blocks of Main Street. They don't have a plaza like you will have. I said, that's it? He says, yeah. And I said, so who did all the marketing? He said, we did. Well, who brought in all the vendors? We did. And I said, so when did it start? He said, Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon, we got here, and we pretty much filled up all the hotels and everything. And our car show runs Friday, Saturday, and we're done Sunday at about 2 in the afternoon. And I said, so how many people are here? And he goes, oh, about 10,000. I said, so how's it been? He said, it's a great town. I said, so will you do it again? He says, oh yeah, we've already booked this weekend for the next 10 years. <laughs> they have 40 weekends of events that are being produced by outsiders. All they did is roll out the welcome mat. Can you imagine having those motorcycle clubs in Raymond 
Can you have, imagine, yeah, you're going, no. You know, but I got to tell you, people that own Harleys are doctors, lawyers, and people with money. Corvette clubs, Mustang clubs, every kind of car club you think of, quilt guilds. Quilters will, you can't believe how far quilters will go. And you know what? Husbands are looking for stuff to do. And so just inviting them in, you know how much they spent? 200 bucks for 40 weekends of events that they don't have to produce. You give them a plaza, it's going to work. So if you do this, you'll be the place Lethbridge and Southwest Alberta comes after working on weekends. It makes you a destination and it reduces your leakage. You have a tremendous amount of leakage of money that people that you earn, you might earn your money in Lethbridge or here, but you're spending in Lethbridge and not so much here. You know, I mean, we saw a lady fill up her whole grocery basket at the mercantile and I go, wow, God bless her for trying to buy all her, her groceries here when it's very limited. Even the deli se section in the mercantile is narrower than the screen. You just, you're underserving yourselves. And they're doing it because they're filling a gap. And same with the hardware store and its, its sports things and the rifles. And they're trying to fill a gap. So that's how powerless could be. So, to wind things down, here we go. Here's the big deal. In the U.S. and Canada, for the first time in history, jobs are going where the talent is or where the talent wants to be. You already have great residential neighborhoods. You have good schools. You have great recreational facilities. You're in a quiet, free range, what I call free range for kids. You're in a fantastic setting, 20 minutes away from the urban area. And I'm telling you, when we drive out on Highway 5, you probably do this too, that decompression you feel. It's like, wow, you have that. And that's why I said the only missing ingredient is downtown. What comes first is that plaza. And I'm guarantee you that everybody in downtown, the businesses that are retail, are going to do way better. So this is really, really critical. Even Urban Lands to Wall Street Journal, they're all saying it. And you know what's really cool about Raymond? Community development is leading economic and tourism development for the first time in U.S. history. And what have you been doing as a town? You've been concentrating on community development. That's the pools. That's the tennis court, the aquatic center, the golf course, uh, 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 the, the ice rink. All of those things you've been doing have been building quality of life. And, and you couldn't be more right on because now we're in the age of placemaking. The only thing you need to do is bring your downtown to life so that you have more of the businesses here without always the need of going to Lethbridge for virtually everything. And by the way, you're never going to outdo Costco. You're not, you're not trying to do that. You want places for people to hang out. You know, even in Old Strathcona, we, which, which is known for White Ave, um, we wanted them to do this, and a hotel is going here, but they had this empty lot. If any of you know White Ave, by the way, even when we were working in St. Albert, we'd go, where do you hang out? White Ave, W-H-Y-T-E, White Ave. I mean, it is the hangout. It's where Edmonton comes to celebrate. But we thought, man, could you take this place, and there it is from the ground level, and turn it, and if you're standing over here, this is Chapters Books over here. This is an old post office that's now Chianti. It's a restaurant, an, an Italian restaurant. If you could do this, it'd be fantastic. Now, in this case, this example, because they can't do it because the hotel bought this lot, but you have a stage there. This is a splash pad. The splash pad, it's the expensive item if you want to do that, but it's all flush mounted. So you can shut it off, fill it full of tables and chairs for movies, for anything you want, easels for art shows. It always has a place up here for, for vendor booths and things. But if you could do something like that in your downtown, wouldn't that be fantastic? So, in closing, you know what? Here's what we want you to do. We want you to create an assessment team, a Raymond assessment team, and go through these. There's 77 suggestions here. A lot of them are just low-hanging fruit. A lot of them you could group together. There's only two relatively expensive things in this whole thing. 
That is a wayfinding system and a plaza. And the plaza can be pretty simple. Put down paver stones, at least get it programmed. You could go to banks, say, banks, would you sponsor three of these chess sets? Or would a business sponsor, you put up a little sign like this that says, chess sets or board games or foosball tables or whatever, sponsored by so-and-so. And you know what? They can be sponsored by people in Lethbridge. We don't care because the activity will be here. And so turn suggestions into recommendations. Remember, these are just suggestions. This is meant to be the conversation starter for new change. You know, um, this effort is 100% about making something happen. So, in a nutshell, what is it you want to be known for? You want to be that ultra-active community? Is it equestrian? Oh, wait, wait, find your focus. What do you want to be about that sets you apart? Number two, develop a wayfinding system so we can find your assets. They're, they're awesome. Number three, make downtown a a top priority. It'll help you reduce leakage locally. Develop a downtown plaza program it, then recruit the downtown business mix. Do the plaza before you recruit the business mix because if you can get people downtown consistency, consistently, there'll be no vacancies. What you've got in Raymond is outstanding. I mean, things like the Early Learning Center, Bright Futures, I think that doing the Broadway dance, uh, th um, hall right here they're already doing registrations is awesome and when we're here this is my very favorite picture i took how cool is that little kids actually in front of a museum gee but they're looking there seeing if they could recognize people and they're walking home from school that's cool you know i think you're not going to lose your roots with your agriculture. I mean, I love the, the Heritage Center out there. Um, I'd love to see it even do more things as things grow. Right now, you're not really seen as a tourist destination, but I think if you promote the reservoir and start promoting some of these things and you can monetize them, I think some of these things say, wow, we could do this and do this, and all of these things will raise money. You know, I think your community's right here, the theater, Everything right here is just really cool. I mean, most cities would, most towns would die to have a room like this theater. And then finally, the best time to plant trees 20 years ago, the second best time is today. You know what? I tell you that Greg's sitting right there with no more technical problems, huh? Pretty good. Pretty good. Is the fact is, his job is new in economic development, community development, these kinds of things. You know what, your CAO, where is he? There he is, right over there. Um, your CAO is retiring, and Curtis, where's Curtis? Right, right, yeah, right there, is coming in. You know what, this is a changing of the guard. And you're seeing this across Canada, where all of a sudden the millennials, the Gen Xers, are starting to come in. And you know what they want? They want life after six o'clock, and we're not talking bar scene. We're talking about a place we can go hang out as a community. And that's why this is so important. And so, in the end, you are already on your way to being a fantastic, vibrant, and a showcase for all of Southwest Alberta. And with that, that's all I've got for you this morning. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, and I'll stick around for a few minutes to answer questions, but you can all, I know that there's a long time to sit. Thank goodness they're comfortable shares. And once again, here's to the future, Raymond. Thank you.